Hey, it's Mark Lowe with Kentucky Tennessee Research. Do you have multiple people on your family tree with the same name? Or do you have folks that you've put on your tree that you look at now and say, I don't think that's the right person? Do you look at documents that are general and perhaps think, is this my family? Well, if you have these questions and more, join us as we look at a couple of examples that will help you focus more and take a closer look. Hey, it's Mark Lowe. Looking a little closer today, wearing my glasses, just trying to find what's out there with the information. And thank you for joining me. I think it's important that when we're looking at our family, are we always looking at the things that surely tie them to us? Well, always take a closer look because if we're looking at a piece of information, are we sure it's our family, particularly if it's not specific? If it's not specific, it's important that we look for supporting evidence. Now, I'm going to give you a, an example today, and we'll do more of these in the future. But at this point, I want to look at something a, a little bit different than a normal record for many of us, but it's one that often you or I might use. And if we're doing, in particular, African American research, here's information about a seven-year-old female named Judy. Now, this is called a slave schedule. And one of the weaknesses of the slave schedule is that at some point in time, actually if they were done in 1850, there was probably not a thought or doubt uh, in that anybody's mind that anyone would go look at this in the future trying to find this ancestor named Judy. So they probably would have provided more information. But remember the time period and remembering the situation. This is a time period when these individuals were considered property or chattel by those folks who were listed as their owners. So the record <coughs> gives me lots of information, but I want to be specific that this seven-year-old female named Judy is the one that I'm looking for, okay? So it's appropriate that we find some additional information, but I want to share with you some of the thoughts by using a slave schedule or any record that is not specific in regard to the information about our family what things might happen. For example, this is an 1850 uh, slave schedule for the McCann family up in Kentucky. And we won't zoom in on it, but this slave schedule is not arranged in family groupings, and most of them are not. They're occasionally listed in family groupings, but often they're just arranged from oldest to youngest or random. So that it's just, a, uh, in this case, just a list of slaves by the McCann family uh, by oldest to youngest. This is the family, by the way, of, of the former Columbus, Ohio mayor, Michael Coleman, one of their longest serving mayors, and his family. And we'll spend some time talking about that again on another day. Okay, as we continue looking, let's look at an example of one that is in a family grouping, and this is very helpful. This is from Robertson County, Tennessee, and this was compiled, this, is, this information was provided by my good friend John F. Baker, Jr., who has written a book about the Wessington Plantation and his Washington family. Uh, and so uh, I'll put the link to his book also down in the links. But he's showing a comparison here with the information provided by George Washington in Robertson County, Tennessee, by the way. Notice on the left, it just has the uh, ages the sex uh, of, of the individual slaves. And on the right is a copy of that same information. And this is where John has actually gone through because they're listed by family groups. And the Washington family papers also occasionally had information where uh, the farm had listed individuals in preparation for tax information or this census collection. And in that case, it's one of the great pieces of information for us to consider is there supporting information that will help us understand more about this record. In that case, uh, the Wessington 
uh, family papers or the Washington family papers as they're called at the Tennessee State Library and Archives has lots of farm records and you often hear us talk about those and we'll definitely be uh, talking about more of those. In fact, John will be uh, sharing and we'll be doing some question and answers about the Washington family in, in not too distant future, so stay tuned. Okay, so if we look at that record, we go back to that, that actually came from a particular uh, the 1850 slave schedule and here's the same information with that data and John's actually written the names on that information just like we looked at earlier because they're collected in family groups or they were written in family groups I'm not sure whether that was the choice of the enumerator or actually how the person reporting the information had it collected and either way it doesn't matter. We can tell very quickly whether it's in family groups, uh, which would be of the ages mixed and male and females, or if they're listed in some other particular order. Okay? Either way, it's our job to kind of slow down and look. But in the case that I was looking at, this is in the seventh district. Uh, I'm looking actually within this group of slaves that were owned by the Norfolk family. In this case, Willie L. Norfolk. And many of you perhaps have heard me talk about the Norfolk family and their connection to the Polks. And if we look at this 1850 schedule, even though it's kind of tiny in there, if you'll notice, Willie Norfolk is uh, at the bottom left column. And just above him is uh, J. Irvin Polk, who is, uh, also has some additional slaves above him. So the, the ability of knowing that they were next door neighbors is important if we're researching the families. But in this case, we're trying to look at individuals actually enumerated in that special schedule. Okay, so I'm looking for something to support that. And that could be as simple as just finding a piece of information. Now, I may know part of the story, but as researchers, it's essential that we keep asking questions. The point in time when we stop asking questions is the day we should probably stop researching for a while. We really need to stop, slow down, or as I say, mull. Think about what we know and what we need to know. Think about the possibilities of where those answers would be. So if we only have a list of people with uh, age and, you know, age and sex, so male and female, and trying to estimate where they are, and we know they should be at a given place, it's unspecific. Any record that is pardon me, that is unspecific may require us to do some special efforts to connect the individuals so that we know that this record, yes, is indeed about the individuals that we think. Okay? So and sometimes it's just pausing. Think about where do I find additional information? What will help me to make this record be talking about the person I want it to talk about? If not, we need to look at an additional, an additional record. Okay, So this is actually a broadside or a large announcement about a sale. So this was in 1852 and it is a trust sale for Willie L. Norfolk. Well, that's whose slave schedule I'm looking at for 1850. And this was found in a Chancery Court case in Robertson County, Tennessee, which is where uh, Norfolk lived. So as we continue to look through that, uh, let me kind of show you the lower part of that. I'm actually looking at, like, knowing within this, there was a slave sale. 21 very likely Negroes. This was referring to the health condition, that there were 21 that were going to be sold. And sadly, in this time in our history, they're considered property. Notice as well, men, women, boys, and girls. And, in fact, in the addition in there, there's uh, six likely mules just listed right after human beings. Three fine mares, two yoke of oxen, etc. So we can actually look at that record and identify it and it likely will help me in regard to what it is I'm looking for. And in this case I want to learn about Judy and other individuals who were in this particular situation at this time. Okay? Well, in the sale bill that I find in that Chancery Court case, I'm able to identify 24 
23 to be sold. Notice it just said 21 at the time. So there's probably some small children that were included in the process and we can identify that. And from that, these 24 names of individuals, I've pulled out and listed their age and the result of the purchaser at the time of the sale and then the amount. And I've analyzed this and I'm looking at this over time period. Now, often it's important, this is a perfect case to put this into something like an Excel spreadsheet or, or any type of spreadsheet or listing because I can actually sort this around. And this is perfect for me because this was done in 1852. So if I go back to the 1850 slave schedule and compare that to this 1852 sale bill, I might be able to be more specific in the comparison of the family. Okay, and that's exactly what I've done. I've taken that section with Willie Norfolk's listing from the 1850 slave schedule in District 7, and that's what you see on the left, and then kind of right next to that, and I know it's kind of tiny, I'll blow it up and show you a section. There's the sale bill that I just showed you, but now I've sorted them in age from oldest to youngest because that's how the listing of the slave schedule was in 1850. So I've taken the sale bill in 1852 and constructed it in the same format. Okay. Well, we are live. You know, that's kind of the whole point. Things happen. So as we continue looking at that, bear with me just a second. There's the close-up of that particular piece of information. There's Willie Norfolk, um, and, and that is just that section of the 1850 slave schedule. Notice on the right, I've copied, remember, from oldest to youngest. And as I continue to compare, uh, you'll see in the blue box, it appears that those ages match up exactly to the time period of the uh, slave schedule. So 52, back to the slave schedule. The ages are not as specific because they're not vital statistics. It's the estimation based on either the, the person who is selling uh, or the agent collecting. Notice that I'm kind of swapping Sam and Mantilla uh, because the female starts and then Sam. There's a variance in the age. And remember, I'm not being precise yet. These are building pieces of information. Uh, Robin and Hetty, looks like they're swapped, the female and the male. And then as we go continually through the process, we examine all the way down the process. We're looking at all of these records, comparing each and every one, al along with lots of other information. Now, there is actually the situation of Judy being on there and of being two years older, which would be true. Her age in 1850 is two years younger than she would be in 1852. And so it appears that based on comparing these, that yes, the Judy that is seven is the Judy that is nine at the time of the sale, and that we can complete that and follow up further in regard to that. Okay, it's only one step in the process, but it's so essential that we take a closer look, that we always look for supporting evidence. That's easy to say, but what I'm asking you to do is Whenever you look at any piece of information about the family, say, is this my family? If we're looking at evidence pointing to an individual, is it the right individual? Not just the same name, not just the same age, but is it the same person? Is it the same man or the same woman? It's our job as researchers to be a little closer. It's our job as researchers to be examine just a little more information. It's our job as researchers to look closer and ask the right question. Now, thank you for joining me today. Thanks again to the Northeast Alabama Genealogical Society for a great weekend. Look forward to sharing more with you tomorrow and the next day. If you're not a member or not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, take a chance, subscribe, and hope that you'll learn more for us. If you have questions, ask them in the box below and we'll follow up. Thanks again and have a great day.